In this short video, we're going to explore how we find power series solutions to differential equations about ordinary points. So we're looking at or our focus mostly is going to be on a second order homogeneous linear differential equation. And so we can divide out by the coefficient on y double prime to get what we call standard form. So we have y double prime plus p of x times y prime plus q of x times y equals zero. And so what is an ordinary point? Uh, so this number x equals x naught is an ordinary point, provided that when we write this differential equation in standard form, both p of x and q of x are analytic at x equals zero. And analytic uh, for us is going to mean that they don't have any vertical asymptote at x equals x sub zero. So an in, in infinite discontinuity is what we want to avoid. And if it's not an ordinary point, then it's called a singular point. But our focus here is on ordinary points. So let's make sure we understand what we mean by singular points. If we write our differential equation x plus 1 y double prime plus 1 over x y prime plus x y equal to 0 in standard form, then we can see that uh, our p of x uh, has vertical asymptotes at x equals 0 and x equals negative 1. So those are my singular points. Uh, if I look over at q of x, its vertical asymptote is already taken into account at x equals negative 1. So those are my singular points. What about the singular points of x squared plus 4 times y double prime plus 3y prime plus xy equals 0? Well, again, writing it in standard form, looking at then the denominator, we'll set that equal to 0, and we see that we'll have singular points points, which are imaginary numbers, plus or minus 2i. So what can we say about uh, solutions at ordinary points? Well, if we have an ordinary point of our uh, differential equation, then we know that there are two linearly independent power series solutions centered at the ordinary point and converging on a radius r, where r is the distance from our ordinary point to the nearest singular point. So for example, here I have a differential equation 1 minus x squared times y double prime minus 2x times y prime plus 2y equals 0. And we're going to try to find a power series solution about x equals 4. We're not going to actually do that. We're just going to just say, what is the radius of convergence? Well, to find the radius of convergence, I need to know the singular points. And so first writing the differential equation in standard form, I see I have a 1 minus x squared in the denominator, meaning that my singular points are plus 1 and minus 1. So the distance from positive 4 to the nearest singular point, that would be positive 1, is 3. So my radius of convergence, if I were to find the solution, power series solution would be r equals 3. Now let's find the radius of convergence for the differential equation x squared minus 6x plus 10 times y double prime minus 2x times y prime plus 3y equals 0. And we're going to find a power series solution about x equals 0. So again, we'll start by writing this in standard form. And we'll look where the denominator is 0. And so I'll have to solve x squared minus 6x plus 10 equals 0. If I use the quadratic formula, I'll find that I have two complex conjugate solutions, 3 plus i and 3 minus i. So I need to find the distance from 0 to the nearest one. So these are symmetric about 0. So I'll just calculate using the 
distance formula and I'll get uh, radical 10. So how do we actually find the power series solution? We saw in our previous example, our previous video, we saw an example uh, where we used this method, which should have reminded us of the method of undetermined coefficients. But here what we're doing is the method of undetermined series coefficients. Now, when we did the undetermined uh, method of undetermined coefficients, we actually found values for the coefficients. Here, we're not going to try to do that. And in general, we're not even going to try to find a formula. What we're going to get is what is called a recurrence relation. And the recurrence relation would provide an algorithm or a formula for finding the coefficients uh, if we were specified initial or boundary uh, value conditions. So let's start with uh, a simple example. We're going to have y double prime minus xy equals 0. It's going to be centered at x equals 0. And if uh, I neglect to state where it's centered, uh, then by default, I mean to say that it's going to be centered at x equals 0. And so our solution y is going to be assumed to be a power series. Uh, y gets multiplied by x. So xy then would be this power series where since I've multiplied uh, x to the n times x, I now have n plus 1 as my exponent. And let's take the derivative of y, just using the power rule. And remember that now we have to start at n equals 1, because there is no c naught uh, term, because the derivative of that constant would, constant would be 0. And then the second derivative using the power rule would have a multiplier n times n minus 1, an exponent of n minus 2. And now we're going to start with n minus 2 in our index. So what we'll do is we'll substitute our expression for y double prime and our expression for xy into our equation. And now what I'd like to do is to think about this for a minute. In my first equation, when n equals 2, I'll have an x raised to the power of 0. And in my second equation, when n equals 0, I'll have x to the power of 1. So there's no constant term, because we've multiplied through by x here. And so what I'd like to do is take the constant term, write it outside of the summation notation or the sigma notation. And we'll see that. Let's write out a few of our terms here. And you can see that we're starting with c naught times x on the right series. And on the left series, we're starting with 2 times c2, then plus 6, 3 times x. So what I'm going to do is write the 2c2 outside of the summation notation. And now, instead of starting at n equals 2, I'd say to myself, well, if I wanted to start where uh, I have an x to the power of 1 as my first index, so if I say k equals 1, what does that mean? Well, I want k equals to 1. And so uh, k in my left-hand series k should equal n minus 2. And that, of course, would mean that n would have to equal k plus 2. So I'm going to start with k equals 1. My exponent will be k, but now I have to shift everything else using this formula. So c sub n became 
uh, C sub K plus two, the N became K plus two, the N minus one became K plus one. Over in the right-hand series, again, I'd like to have this equal the power of K, so I, that would mean K would have to equal N plus one, or N would equal K minus one. So I'm going to start with k equals 1. My new exponent is k. I'll have to change the c sub n to c sub k minus 1. And so you have to work through these series very methodically. It's good to do a check when you're done and just to make sure that, OK, with my first value here, k, when k equals 1, I'll have x to the power of 1. Originally, I had n equals 0, and I had x to the power of 1 as my first term. My coefficient originally was c sub 0, and now when k equals 1, my original coefficient is c sub 0. So that's good. Uh, if you have something like c sub negative 1, then you need to rethink how you changed your indices. Uh, so in the first series, let's do the same check. I want to have x to the power of 1 as my first term. And uh, when n equals 2 here, I had x to the power of 0, but I wrote that over as c to the power of 2. And so when n would equal 3, I'd have x to the power of 1. And then my, uh, so the linear coefficient, the coefficient on x, happened when n equals 3. And so I would have, when n equals 3, I would have 3 times 2, which, which is 6. And when k equals 1, I have 3 times 2 equals 6. So this change is what I want. And what's the goal of making this change? Is that now I have like terms. Every term in its order is a like term in the sense that it's all multiplied by the same power of x. And so I could write this as a single sum starting with k equals 1. And then I can collect the like terms, which really means factor out the x to the power of k. All right. So when I do that, I still have this term, this constant term on its own. That's not going anywhere. Uh, but then I can write the rest using the summation notation, factoring out the x sub k. And so now I have the fact that, okay, since this equals zero, all of the coefficients have to equal zero. So first of all, that will mean c2 equals zero. But that also means that this coefficient on x to the power of k, which is really this formula here, this formula has to equal zero for any value of k, um, well, um, starting with 1. Right? And what does that mean? Well, if I solve this for c to the power of k plus 2, that's going to be c to the power of k minus 1 over quantity k plus 2 times k plus 1. So I've got uh, c sub 2 equal to 0. And I've got this recurrence relation or recurrence formula for the rest of the coefficients. So we're going to take the time now. We normally don't have to do this. But we're going to take the time to actually uh, look at and try to find a formula for the uh, coefficients. So if I look at k equals 1, that would correspond to c sub 3 equaling c naught over 3 times 2. Now we only have a connection for c2 and for uh, anything bigger than 2. So that tells me that c1 and c naught are arbitrary constants. So we can't replace them with anything without further information. So we'll just leave it as uh, c naught. C, when k equals 2 in our formula here, that would tell me that c4 is c1 over 4 times 3. 
And when k equals 3, c5 is going to be c2 over 5 times 4. But remember, c2 equals 0. So that tells me that c5 will also equal 0. Let's go through a few more. When I put uh, k equals 4, that'll give me c sub 6 is c3 over 6 times 5. But c3, I have a formula for that, so I can make that substitution. And I'll have c0 over 6 times 5 times 3 times 2. This is close to being 6 factorial, but it's not. It's missing the 4. Let's do it for k equals 5. We'll get the seventh coefficient then is c4 over 7 times 6. But I have a formula for c4, so make that substitution. And I'll get 7 times 6 times 4 times 3. Again, this is close to a factorial. It's close to being 7 factorial, but it's missing the factor of 5. For k equals 6, c8 is going to be c5 over 8 times 7, but we know c5 is 0 because c2 is 0, so c8 is 0. And so now we can start to see a pattern for each one of these columns that uh, for 1, 4, 7, 10, and so on, that means that c3, c6, c9, c12, so any times the index is a multiple of 3, it's going to depend on c0. And the numerator is going to be very close to a factorial, but it's going to be missing uh, some of the factors. So here I'm missing the 7, and I'm missing the 4. Uh, so then for c4, c7, and c10, that's a multiple of 3 plus 1. Again, I have a uh, fraction which depends on c1, and the denominator is almost a factorial. And then for uh, c5, c8, and c11, so those are powers of 3 plus 2, um, then we know that uh, in c2 as well, um, all of those coefficients are 0. All right, so from that recurrence relation, we know that, again, if you take a power of 3, and add 2 for that index, so 2, 5, 8, 11, so on. All of those coefficients are 0. And then um, if I add 1, you get this relationship, which essentially says that uh, it's almost a factorial, but you have to be divide out these terms times c naught. And then for the powers of 3, you get, again, something which is a factorial with some numbers divided out. Uh, and this should be, one of them has to be C1. Let me just go back for a minute here and see which one it is. That the uh, ones that are the power of 3, that's C0. And the ones that are not the powers of 3, this should have been a C1. So I'll have to erase that and replace it with a C sub 1. OK. Again, I'll just replace that at all the subsequent sides. And so I may have these again. backwards. Oh, with the plus one. Yeah. So I have this backwards. So this would have been C0, and that is C1. All right, so let's do another example. We're going to find a power series solution to this differential equation. Yeah. Make sure I can see this. Of course, it's going to equal 0. It's a homogeneous equation. We're going to do it centered at about x equals negative 1. Uh, that could be uh, a lot of writing. So in order to avoid uh, writing the x plus 1 to the power of whatever it's going to be, 
we're going to make a change of variables. We're going to replace, we're going to set t equal to x plus 1. In other words, that's the same as setting x equals t minus 1. Uh, the derivatives are fairly easy. dy dx is just dy dt. And uh, d squared y over dx squared is still the d squared y over dt squared. Uh, but now our new differential equation is centered at t equals 0. So that'll just make the rest of the analysis simpler. Uh, we're still going to start off by assuming that y is a power series in t, take its derivative, take its second derivative, write that as a formula, then substitute these into our new de, the ones that have values of t in it. And uh, so now I got to work this out, uh, essentially using the distributive property for the t minus 1 and the 2t minus 2. 3. So when I multiply in the t, now instead of having a t to the power of n minus 1, I have t to the power of n. I'm going to go ahead and subtract the original power series with the t to the n minus 1 power. And then I'll have multiply in the 2t. That'll give me a t to the n plus 1 power. And subtract off 3 times the original power series. All right, so let's look at this carefully. The blue power series starts with t to the 0. When n equals 2, I have 2 minus 2, so t to the 0. This first power series in white uh, starts with the power of t to the power of 1. I'm subtracting off a power series with t to the power of 0 as the first term or the first exponent on t is 0, and I have a first exponent at 1 and a first exponent with 0. So I look among these, and the highest one is 1, which means what I want to do is with every power series that, whose first term has an exponent of 0, I'm going to take that term, so which will be the constant term, out of the sigma notation. So I think I did this pretty carefully. So from the first term, when n equals 2, I'll have c sub 2 times 2 times 1 times t to the power of 0. So that's just 2c sub 2. Now, instead of starting at n equals 2, I'm going to start at n equals 3. Everything else doesn't change. So I still have the c sub n times n times n minus 1 times t to the power of n minus 2. I just increase the index by 1 because the n equals 2 term I wrote separately. All right, this has t to the power of 1 in its first term. So I'm not going to make any changes to it. The next series starts with t to the power of 0. So I'll go ahead and write the term that has t to the power of 0. So that would be when n equals 1. I'll have t to the power of 0 times 1 times c1. Now there's a subtraction here. So I'm going to say that's subtracting c1. And now what I have to do is increase the index by 1 because for n equals 1, I wrote that term separately. So now I'm starting at n equals 2. Uh, my next power series already starts with an exponent of 1. So no changes there. And then in the last power series, again, I'm going to take the first term. And that corresponds to n equals 0. So that would be minus 3c0. I'll write that outside of the summation notation. Increase the index by 1 because I already wrote the first term on its own. And now let's put all of these constant terms in front. And let's write the rest of the summation here. Now, I would like to have this. Again, I want to write all of these summations with an 
index k, where I'm starting with the same index value, k equals 1. And I, because I'd like to have this start with t to the power of k. So k would have to equal n minus 2 for my first summation, which would mean that n would be k plus 2. So I'm going to make those substitutions. Uh, so when n equals 3, that would mean k would start with 1, k equals 1. And then n would be replaced with k plus 2 everywhere else. All right. In my next sum, I don't need to make any substitution. I'm just going to replace n with k because I would already have t to the power of k. So that's my guiding principle. What is the index here? Or the, the, not the index, the exponent. And okay, so the minus c1 is over here now. In the next summation, I want n minus 1 to equal k so that I will uh, have the same exponent t to the power of k. And then when n equals 2, k will equal 1. And by the way, this should work out. Uh, I should always be starting with k equals 1. Uh, and then I'll make the substitution that n equals k plus 1. All right, and then in my next summation, again, I want uh, n plus 1 to equal k. So this is the substitution that I'll make. And then whenever I see an n, I'll replace that with k minus 1. And then finally, the last summation, I already have t to the power of n. So I'll just replace n with k. So everything looks the same. So now every term is going to have the same uh, exponent corresponding in every sum. And so I can factor out the t to the power of k, write this in a single summation notation with this set of constants out in front. So now this is equal to 0. That's what our differential equation says. So that means that all of the coefficients have to equal 0. In other words, this constant term over here has to equal 0. And then for each value of k starting with 1, this expression inside the brackets has to equal 0. Now I can clean up this expression a little bit. It's nice to have descending uh, values of k, so k plus 2, k plus 1, k, and then ck minus 1. There are two like terms. I have two terms that are multiplied by c sub k. So I go ahead and factor out that c sub k and write those coefficients inside parentheses. And now I can say, all right, that uh, we're going to have as a solution the power series in t, but t, remember, was x plus 1. And what do we know about the coefficients? Well, c0 and c1, there's no restriction on them. Those are arbitrary. If I set this constant coefficient equal to 0, then I know that c2 has to be 1 half of the quantity c1 plus 3c0. And if I solve this expression inside the brackets for c sub k2. That tells me that I have this recurrence relationship for k equals 1, 2, 3, and so on. And so this is the way we're going to write our solutions, unless there's some reason for us to actually calculate these coefficients. Uh, we would calculate these coefficients. They would be expressions in terms of c1 and c0. So we could actually get two then a sets of coefficients, one set of coefficients, which is a multiple of c1, and the, the other coefficients will be multiples of c sub 0. So that's our method. Uh, and 
it works whenever we have an ordinary point. And we are going to see that if we have a singular point, we have to do significantly more work, but we can still find a solution.